Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 166. My name is Ariel bin Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a word of prayer. Avinu Malkinu, our Father, our King Lord, we come to you once again tonight, as we always do, seeking your face and anticipating that your Holy Spirit will make his presence known to us, that we will uh, have a, a time where we can um, study your words and allow uh, the truths to penetrate and to, um, to challenge us and to convict us and to help us to grow and to continue to be uh, vessels that are usable for your kingdom, for your service. Lord, we have so many prayer requests and concerns, uh, many, many uh, loved ones that we think about that are um, in need of healing and, 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 and a, just that touch that can only come from you. And so we seek you in this time during uh, a time of need for so many people. I, I'm not even naming them, Lord. There's just uh, a, a good number of people who are close to us. Um, we're praying for your strength. Uh, continue to bless us and to protect us during these um, rapidly um transitioning times, uh, just so many changes taking place in the world around us um, uh, with COVID and uh, just you know more news of more infections and uh, just the political confusion in the, in the United States and around the world. Um, Lord, they're dark times. Uh, and it's, it's increasingly ever evident, at least to me, as a student of the Bible, Lord, that we have got to strengthen our relationship with you, we've got to press in. We've got to uh, seek your face in all of these matters, and uh, know that you're a God who's in control and who's um, uh, going with us, despite the fact that we can't always see you leading us at times. So, help us to have faith, strengthen our faith, help us to uh, be dependent on you, and we'll be careful to continue to raise up uh, a voice of, of moral sanity of, of spiritual righteousness of light of salt will continue to be um faithful to you lord as you strengthen us and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory of Hashem yeshua amen thank you everyone for joining me week after week my name is ariel bin lyman hanavi i'm a Torah teacher at congregation kayla dunval thornton colorado the harvest congregation and these are the live internet studies brought to you week after week every saturday evening. I'll give you more details about the study later on, but let's just jump right into our Romans 14 study. Uh, this is episode number 166, and last week we um, read through Romans chapter 15, the first 13 verses. This is a Romans 14 unplugged feast and fast and food, oh my, uh, study on Romans 14, the whole chapter 14, but 15, the first 13 verses, carries, in my opinion, the final uh, thoughts on Paul in that section. So after reading that um, uh, section in chapter 15, let's just jump into my commentary, which is available on my website at tatesaytorah.com. Um, let's jump into the study that I wrote and work our way down through this. I think I won't be able to finish this tonight. I was planning on it, um, but as it turns out, um, there's enough material here that's going to probably push me over into next week. And so since this is um, episode number 166 for the live studies, but it's episode number 98 or something like that for the um, Roman study, it looks like it'll probably go out right to an even 100. We'll see what happens. All right, so for those of you who are following along can see my screen, those of you with me in the live study class right now, um, as well as those on YouTube, obviously, uh, just follow my um uh, follow my uh, uh, prompting on the screen there. You can see in highlight in blue. I'll just read through my commentary and only pause occasionally as I need to. Here's what I have to say. So we just read, pretend like we just read Romans 15, 1 through 13. Here's what I say. Thus, the lasting solution to settling petty food-related issues that might occur in our communities is to live lives consistent with Messiah's perfect example of love and humility and to not focus on our own smallness in the parentheses in uh, air quotes there in, well not air quotes real quotes on, on our own smallness in light of the surpassing glory of our of god our father but to continually yield to and to um allow the Ruach HaKodesh, that is the Holy Spirit, to transform us by, and you can see this part is in italics, by the renewing of our minds so that we might prove 
what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And of course, that italicized section is a quote from Paul's earlier chapter here in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I think that's probably KJV um, that I think I quoted there. It might be ESV. So um, we're talking about in the Roman community in Romans 14, um, judgmental attitudes that had um, risen between what Paul labels as the weak and the strong in his community, likely a faction of, of Jewish population and Gentile population, weak and strong there, and um, weak probably being the Jewish population. We can call them weak for a number of reasons. One of the reasons that often uh, that uh, many Christian commentators purport is that their weakness is tied to their Torah keeping. Um, I disagree with that assessment and that particular interpretation. I think there are other ways we can describe their weakness, but um, what we do know is that Paul counts himself among the strong, and we know that from reading Romans chapter 15 at the very first few verses. He said, we who are strong. So this disagreement, this judgmentalism that was taking place is um, brought on because of differences of food sources, of fasting days or special days, Paul calls them. Um, some commentators believe that these are uh, Sabbaths versus Sunday issues. I, I also disagree with that interpretation, but many, many Christian commentators feel that that's the way that Paul's addressing the issue. Either way, um, even if it's not uh, even if it is Sabbath issues, and even if Paul's having a disagreement over what's kosher and what's not, which I disagree with that position as well. So either way you interpret the passage, well, you know, by today's standards, we have some disagreements going on as well. We have some disagreements over what's being disagreed about, right? Um, but either way, the solution is still the same, and that's what I'm trying to hit at here is Paul realizes that this is a serious enough issue, you know, that, that people are going to blows, as it were, with one another, spiritual blows, excommunicating people or something like that, um, uh, you know, what do we say, uh, ostracizing people, alienating people, judging one another, um, whether it was verbally or it was um, some sort of judgmentalism that was maybe physical. Paul doesn't go into all the details, but either way, it's something that caught his attention all the way, uh, probably in Corinth where Paul's writing from when he's writing this letter to Romans. It caught his attention, and the Holy Spirit pressed upon him to pin the words that we're reading now. And Paul's no um, newcomer to this game of of Jews and Gentiles judging one another over um, you know social issues and things like that. He knows from experience, um, as a religious Jewish man himself, that the problem is really spiritual. The problem is spiritual. And so we've got to turn to the Lord for the solution. We can't expect um, humans to solve this issue and to solve it on a permanent level. So that's what I'm going for in this particular part of my commentary. Let me keep reading down through the, my notes and you'll just catch this. So um, I say we must be reminded that in our communities, so I'm speaking to us in our modern 21st century religious settings now, in our communities, there are strong people and there are weak people. And this is just to be understood, you know, ask, have a conversation with any pastor and he'll tell you there are strong and weak in the congregational sense by today's standards that likely doesn't include always um, perspective that you're weak because you keep Torah. Usually people just call weak people um, people who are maybe new to the faith, new to Christianity, uh, so they're not quite fully on board with what it means to walk as a Christian, so we say weak in that sense. Um, but for whatever reason, we, we still have strong and weak in, in our communities, and that's probably not exactly the same type of weakness that Paul was talking about. That was more, I think, more of a first century phenomenon. But without going into all those details, I say indeed, coming full circle from where Paul began this chapter, right, chapter 14 of Romans, the first few pasukim, the first few verses, verses are worth recalling. So let's look once again, having looked at the end of Paul's discussion in chapter 15, let's kind of cycle back around again to catch the context of where Paul started this whole discussion. Let's look at the first few verses, first four verses, and um, see how this fits together again. Paul began uh, his um, discussion or his uh, his warning to the weak and the strong, and he was primarily, if you've read the chapter and you're familiar, he's primarily addressing the 
strong, meaning those who are Christians and those who are um, comfortable with expressing their faith in a way that is non-judgmental towards others who have different opinions or who aren't in the same spiritual place that they are at yet. They're strong because they're non-judgmental. They're strong because they are confident in their faith and in their expression of faith. They're strong because they know who Yeshua is and what Yeshua has done for them. But Paul says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But, Paul says, not to quarrel over opinions. So you're going to have differences of opinions, but don't bring um, weak people into the discussion so that you can fight with them. That's going to defeat the purpose of trying to build communities. You're not going to be able to stay together if you're always quarreling, if you're always saying, hey, let's talk about what we don't like about each other's walk or halacha. Paul continues in verse 2, one person believes that he may eat anything. We talked about how that this is likely a fasting issue or in, co- in conjunction with um, questionable food origin discussions. You know, where did that food come from? Did you buy it in the common meat market? Remember, in Paul's day in the first century, it was very um, it was very popular to, to buy meat. And we're talking about like as in meat, not just food. But it was popular to buy meat in um, butchers that had some connection to a uh, pagan temple. So if you were a religious Jew in Paul's day, you were likely not shopping in um, public butchers, Gentile-owned ones particularly, because the meat was questionable when it came to origin. Even though it was kosher from the biblical perspective, you know, permissible uh, animals were used, but the connection to idolatry made that meat off limits. Well, that kind of all, whole idolatry um, connection uh, spilled over into Gentiles who were coming into the faith of Judaism, and so we had some disagreements. We had some Gentiles who weren't raised with that those sensitivities who were saying it's okay to eat that meat, and then religious Jews who were saying, no, if you want to be part of our communities, you need to keep the same strictness of kosher as we do. So that's going to cause some friction there. So one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. And I, I might add, he's taking this vegetable-only stance, likely as a religious Jew, so that he can avoid any um, association from those pagan temples and the meat that they were, the animals they were slaughtering and turning into uh, items sold in the butcheries. Um, So that's why we have some disagreement. It doesn't mean, I believe, that one person believes he can eat anything such as pork, and another person says the weak person eats only vegetables. I think if that were truly the issue where it was a kosher versus non-kosher issue, like like many pastors will tell you today, I think Paul probably would have written the verse this way. So listen, he probably would have said, one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only kosher food. He would have made that distinction or eats only what is uh, permissible according to Torah. I think he probably would have uh, articulated it that way because Paul knew what it means to keep kosher, but he didn't say that. He just said eats only vegetables. So um, I could be wrong on that issue, uh, but I, I, this is the perspective I'm taking at the moment. Verse 3 uh, said, let not the one who eats right? Despise the one who abstains. Clearly, at this point in time, it could be a, um, a a fasting issue because he says abstention, you know, abstaining. But he could, of course, by context, say abstaining from eating meat. So, let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. So, so it could be uh, a fasting issue. It could be just a, a, a avoiding ish, a food offered in the marketplace. It could be both. Uh, verse 4, he says, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Right? Um, Jews judging Gentiles, Gentiles judging Jews. It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Um, if you'd like to hear my take on those verses particularly, go back and listen to uh, past episodes of this particular study, Romans 14 Unplugged, Feast and Fast and Food, oh my, uh, to see where I take my um, uh, position. But I don't have time to do it right now. Let's keep going with where we're at now in the commentary. I say, these are my own notes, not everyone will be able to adequately grasp the foundational truths of the spiritual concepts that are detailed 
in Ephesians chapter 2 and elsewhere in Paul's letters. Now, why do I mention Ephesians chapter 2? It's because, in my opinion, that Paul's drawing from similar experiences when um, working with communities that are comprised of Jews and Gentiles. Remember, in, in first century dynamics, it was more common to find religious Jews and um, uh, Gentile Christians congregating together in close-knit communities where they're having these kind of challenging situations where they're uh, kind of hashing out their differences over matters of interpretation of, of God's word, you know, what, what details holiness. But in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul really hits it on the head where he's talking about Gentiles being brought into a community um, relationship with existing Jewish members of the church. And so he challenges the Gentile communities to understand how they fit in alongside of God's existing Jewish believers, right, in the church. And so that's why I say um, Ephesians chapter 2 is a good place to look uh, and to study in conjunction with challenging passages like here in, in chapter 14 of Romans, where we have Jews and Gentiles kind of judging one another. What would Paul have them to do? Um, and so that's where I say, what I say next is, what can Paul offer us that can be used in everyday settings and situations? So we know what he said to them. We have our, we have the letters left behind for us to read how he addressed them. But what if we have similar situations today? What if we had um, disagreements and judgmental attitudes going on over food, over Torah keeping in church settings? Do we have those today? Well, maybe in traditional church settings, we might not have as much of that uh, because much of the sentiment in local average Gentile Christian church settings is that the Torah has been set aside, it's been nullified, it's been uh, negated to kind of just a, a teaching tool. It's not really something we should be following for our everyday um, living. So maybe we're not going to have as many disagreements. But in Messianic circles, where we have that kind of cutting edge, should we be keeping Torah or should we discard it, those type of discussions are more relevant and heated, then we need to be able to turn to Paul and ask him, um, how can we solve these? Now, I say turn to Paul. What I really mean is turn to Hashem himself, turn to God and to the Holy Spirit. But what tool does God use to convey his message to us and to speak to us? Well, it's the Bible. So that's what I mean by turn to Paul. So I say in my commentary, what can be applied across the board, no matter your spiritual prowess? So we have some people in Torah circles that say, well, I can read the Hebrew, I can read the Greek, and I understand Paul a little better than you, so here's why I think this is what is uh, the solution. And then you have other people say, well, okay, I'm not that versed in Hebrew and Greek or the Bible uh, as a whole, um, but I still need, and I still belong to a community that needs the solutions offered by the Bible, so what can I do on my own? This is like, you know, so we have differences of opinions, and we have differences in expertise in the Bible. That's why I'm asking the question, what can be applied across the board that you can do no matter how well you are versed in studying scripture? Here's what I have to say. In Paul's concluding thoughts on this sensitive food and table fellowship issue that we encounter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's here that we encounter our final, what I say, somewhat practical, down-to-earth solution for avoiding the kinds of judgmental and condescending attitudes that might crop up between the Christian communities there in Rome, right? So we have the historical uh occurrence, the historical event, that we as moderns have to kind of make some practical application from. So we have the Christian communities in Rome there that were facing these. And remember, these communities, were, I say, are likely made up of a majority of Gentiles and a minority of Jews, which is similar to today's uh, church settings, right? Unless you go to a synagogue, uh, like a, a traditional Jewish synagogue, most Christian churches and most Messianic congregational synagogues are both going to have similar uh, breakdowns, a majority of Gentiles. Uh, and I say both under the banner of the Lordship of Yeshua the Messiah. So we're really talking about believing communities, not necessarily the traditional uh, uh, rabbinic uh, synagogue or anything like that. But 
So uh, they're both serving Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel, and the Savior of the world. So um, this is aimed primarily that what I'm about to talk about is I'm prim- aimed primarily at uh, uh, we who are in the church, we who name the name of Yeshua, we claim to be Christian. I'm not, not saying that all of us are, but that's at least the um, public stance that we're taking. So let's turn once again to Barnes Notes on the Bible. Uh, you can find these on any website. They're public, uh, uh, publicly accessible. Um, and let's he's going to state this pragmatic solution quite succinctly. So I'm going to insert his comments here for us to ponder. All right. So uh, Barnes has some notes about Romans 14.12. So let's just pick up this um, quote right here on my screen. Here's what Barnes says. Speaking of Romans 14, so we're look, we're commenting on these last few verses, uh, the last two verses in the chapter um, of Romans 14. Do you have faith or hast thou faith in the Old English? The word faith here, according to Barnes, refers only to the subject under discussion, to the subject of meats, drinks, etc. So we pose the question, if you have faith, Paul says, the faith that you have, I'm paraphrasing, keep that faith to yourself. We pose the somewhat silly question, like I say it's silly because I think the answer is obvious, but is Paul actually um, warning us not to share our salvific faith, our salvation faith with other people, keep that to ourselves? Um, I've read a few commentaries that actually suggest that Paul's maybe um, telling us to tone down our our spiritual witness so as not to offend people. Um, kind of like uh, the way the Catholic modern Catholic Church has taken kind of a stance to not try seek to convert um, religious Jews to Christianity because it's so offensive. Um, and I'm thinking, well, we don't want to knock on doors and witness to people with the goal of just offending them. That's not our goal. Our goal is to bring them to a, a confession or profession of faith. Uh, you know, we're not seeking to openly offend, but at the same time, we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. I mean, that's the wrong position to take. So, um, I'm not saying that those Christian commentators are telling you to be ashamed of the gospel, but my point is, I think modern Christians, the watered-down church, people, the compromised, people who call themselves Christian but aren't truly Christian, God knows, um, there are, there are a good number of people out there who will say, well, I'm, I don't really need to share my faith. I just need to be faithful to God and do my best to serve Him and try to get along with everybody. You know, we don't really need to go around offending people by w- telling them uh, that what they're doing is wrong. We just need to love on them and be accepting of other people's differences in opinions and different lifestyles, you know, no matter what that is. Uh, so let's just try to get along with one another instead of trying to um, always tell someone that they're doing something wrong. It almost sounds like the uh, the kind of the soft um, message that you hear from many popular Christian pastors, maybe kind of like the Joel Olstein type of uh, message that you might catch if you were to tune into that type of sermon. Not trying to slam uh, Pastor Olstein in this particular uh, uh, comment here, but you guys understand my point. Um, but Barnes reminds us, and I'm trying to remind us as well, Faith here, when Paul says, do you have faith? Keep that to yourself. The context is the issue of how you perceive um, uh, what food you can um, partake of and where you can buy your particular meats. And you have to really take it all the way back to Paul's day to get the full context. Otherwise, by today's standards, you know, if I'm going to tell someone, hey, did you buy that from uh, supermarket A down the street. Well, I don't think they're really the best supermarket. You should really be shopping at supermarket B. Um, today, that kind of conversation is just kind of it's odd. It's kind of silly, right? Because we don't have uh, pagan temples slaughtering animals that get turned into uh, items that you can buy at your butcher. So, um, at least not in America. We, and in Europe, we don't have that. Maybe in some third world countries, maybe you might encounter that. But um, we don't have it in America. So, um, we even if we go back to Paul's context and apply it to the people there, we can't easily make a one-to-one application for today's communities. But nevertheless, we still need to understand what the passage is saying. So that's why Barnes says, do you believe that it's right to eat all kinds of foods, etc.? The apostle had admitted that this was the true doctrine, but he maintains that it should be so held as to not give offense. Um, Of course, I think Barnes is probably working from the notion that Paul converted to Christianity and left his Judaism behind, and therefore Paul was taking the, the popular Christian stance held by today's 
Christianity that he can eat anything, including pork, shellfish, lobster, ham, um, you know, shrimp, oyster, crabs, uh, all these other things, as opposed to keeping kosher. I disagree with Barnes' assessment there, if indeed that's what Barnes means by um, – uh, do you believe that it's right to eat all kinds of foods? So, but uh, the context still is that it's a food-related issue when it comes to do you have faith on this? That's the point I'm trying to bring up. Um, have it to thyself. Commenting on that section, Burns says, "Do not obtrude your faith or opinion on others. That is, don't don't um, uh, force your opinion. I think that's uh, what the the word obtrude there. Let me just check. Um, become noticeable in an unwelcome or intrusive way." Um, imposed, yeah, that was, I was right. Don't force your opinion on someone in an intrusive way, you know, shove it down their throat, um, make them feel uncomfortable with the, with their opinion, uh, on, on this particular topic. Be satisfied with cherishing the opinion and acting on it in private while, without bringing it forward to produce disturbance in the church. So we have quite a number of issues that we could apply this to, uh, by today's Christian standards, um, that aren't really addressed in Paul's letter. Uh, um, you know, we could talk about any number of preferences in the church, differences over, uh, say, fashion. We could talk about differences of opinion over, um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, you know, sexual orientation, you know, uh, homosexuality and things like that in the church. There are quite a number of hot button issues that we could bring into this discussion and perhaps have some meaningful dialogue on do we keep our opinion to ourselves, or do we share it with others knowing that we're going to offend people i don't think it's wrong to share your opinion even if you know it's somewhat divisive and and and, and um heated but the overall message that paul i believe is trying to challenge us with is even though you're going to disagree on some issues at the end of the day because not everyone's going to agree what you shouldn't be doing is judging one another just because you do have the differences. You're not allowed to have the judgmental attitude. You're not allowed to take that particular um, action uh, in the church. Uh, yes, you can have disagreements. It's impossible for everyone to agree. That's just the way the nature of uh, having uh, you know two people come together. But we don't need to a come to blows over our disagreements. We certainly don't need to go there. And we don't even need to force our differences on, on one another. Those are the two um, areas where Paul's going to tell us uh, we're, we're in the wrong. If we're, if we're forcing our opinion and we're hurting one another because of our strongly held opinions, things like that. Also, if we're excommunicating people because of those differences, well, we need to bring in a, um, a leadership uh, uh discussion if we're talking about excommunication you know is it truly just a difference of opinion is it something that's a foundational truth that that requires uh excommunication etc etc so barnes continues um you know keep this opinion that you have before god where god is the only witness uh, God sees your sincerity and will approve your opinion. That opinion cherish and act on, yet so as not to give offense and to produce disturbance in the church. God sees your sincerity. This is Barnes uh, speaking on Paul's uh, verses. God sees your sincerity, and he sees that you are right, and you will not offend him. Um, your brethren do not see that you're right, and they will be offended. So, uh, again, this is kind of a, gen a general um, all-purpose uh, interpretation of the passage. It carries some truth to it. Uh, I don't agree with everything that Barnes uh, writes um, and implies, but I think he's headed in the right direction in this particular case. Um, this is what I, I'm aiming for, the practical. So that's why I included it in my commentary at this point in time. Um, and there's a footnote to where I pulled that Barnes uh, uh, commentary. It's probably an online resource, but I don't want to click it right now. Let's continue through my own commentary. There's an, a final quote here that where I pull from uh, Tim Haig of Tor Resource, one of my favorite teachers. And here's what I have to say. And lastly, these are my notes. Since Tim Haig of TorResource.com quite often supplies practical truths that are so vital for us to properly understand the Apostle Paul from a first century messianic perspective, I've decided that we'll draw this Romans 14 study to a close. So we're going to pull in uh, uh, Haig's material. We'll draw it to a close by supplying one final quote from him as well. And of course, those of you who've been studying my commentaries for any length of time know that I pull from Tim Haig quite often. He is a voice of 
um, clarity for messianic communities in particular. Maybe a lot of Christians aren't really um, aware of what he writes or why, because they're not really seeking to understand the the, um, the Bible from a pronomian or a pro-Torah perspective, at least not yet. Maybe in time they will, and I pray that they will. But for the moment, mostly Tim Haig's comments are going to be beneficial to those who are in a position where they are already open to addressing any particular Bible, biblical topic from the um, position that God wants us to, to, to keep his Torah under the power of the Holy Spirit. So, um, Let's look at Tim Hague here. Addressing verses uh, 22 and 23, here's what he says in his lengthy commentary and his Romans commentary that I have available, that, that is available on his website, but I've purchased it. Or you can buy it in the book form as well. But it's available in a, a digital form as well, like a PDF document, as well as uh, audio that he recorded. So I highly recommend it. Go to his website at torresource.com and, and uh, uh, just look through his store and you can find those um, resources available. So first I quote... Or first, uh, Tim Haig quotes uh, verse 22 for us so that we can catch the context. These are Paul's words first. Paul says, The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. So again, is Paul asking us to keep the faith that we have about Messiah Yeshua to ourselves? I think it's intuitively obvious, in my opinion, that he's not. Paul doesn't want us to... Um, uh, keep our gospel uh, from other people, right? Don't keep that as your own conviction before God. Uh, no, the context is the 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 um, conviction that we have about um, about where food is purchased and what we can eat, uh, and things like that. So um, here, and and Tim Haig just describes it, so I don't even really need to comment. Here's what we say: This is these are Tim Haig's words. In the context, just like Burns uh, highlighted, faith means the conviction that one has the God-given right to a, to a particular halakha. So we're talking about matters of taking what the Bible says and then interpreting it personally so that you can walk out, so that you can live out what you believe the Bible's teaching you. Of course, that's going to produce differences on, on any given community level. And so that's what I mean by halakha. It's the particular Hebrew word that means to walk out your faith, or put the feet, put feet to your faith. It can also mean uh, Jewish law within certain context, or by today's standards, we would say church policy, something like that, halakha. So Tim Haig says, Paul is not exhorting the Roman believers to hide their confession of Yeshua. Right? Why do we even have to say that? It's because some pastors would have you to believe that Paul's advocating a kind of a no uh, offense policy where we don't want to upset someone if we know that what we're going to tell them is upsetting. So if you perceive that someone would be upset if you tried to witness to them, well, then Paul's going to tell you, keep that faith to yourself. Don't offend them with that. Just live your faith out. Don't tell them. Um, I still think that in those cases, Paul would say, uh, people need to hear it no matter what. The, the gospel is offensive. Again, I'm not saying Paul's teaching us to openly offend, and he's certainly not teaching us to openly judge. But what Paul is challenging us to do as believers is to share our faith, whether it's in word or in deed, but to share our faith with those around us who don't know. That is our commission from Yeshua himself. So Paul's going to have to agree with that. And that's what uh, Haig's trying to just remind us of. All right? But, Tim Haig reminds us, Paul's point is that one may possess an inward freedom without having to express it outwardly. So you have your opinions on particular Bible matters. Should you go around spouting all your opinions, even if people are going to disagree with you and uh, think you're uh, being offensive? That's where Paul is going to say, hey, you have some opinions. Maybe they're um, heated opinions. Maybe they are uh, uh, you know, hot topics. Uh, don't just go around trying to offend everyone. Don't just go around trying to get in everyone's face and talk everyone down and prove that you're right and that they're wrong. That's the wrong thing to do. Okay. Uh, Tim Hay continues. What is more, this inward freedom that believers often have allows for one to bend in order to accommodate the other person. And this is really the beauty, uh, Tim Hick doesn't say this, but this is my own, my own take. This is really the beauty of having differences of opinion, but at the same time, being filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can be gentle with one another. We have the freedom to somewhat 
yield to another person's perspective without having to agree with them. We can sometimes, what we might say, agree to disagree for the sake of of um, maintaining friendship, maintaining you know the common peace. Don't just stand up in church and you know start spouting off all of your opinions if you know people are going to be openly offended, and you know you're doing it for the sake of you say, well, it's truth, and they need to hear it. Well, um, being led by the Spirit of God is not only knowing what to say if you have the truth, but knowing when and how to say what you believe is truth. If you can just consider yourself a teacher or a prophet type, you know, where you think I've just got to tell people what the truth is, well then you also need to um, be uh, in tune with the Spirit of God so that you know when to say what is truth. Don't just go spouting off truth if you think that they need to hear it when perhaps they're not ready to hear what you have to say at the time. Pray about what you need to say. Pray when you should be sharing these truths to other people. Uh, Because um, if they don't want to hear you, well, then it doesn't matter how much truth you think you need to tell them. If they're just going to shut the door when you start talking, if they're just going to shut you out or um, uh, you know, walk away when you start talking because they know that you're always out to offend. Then, what good is the truth that you supposedly have? So, you know, learn to temper what you want to say and when you want to say it. Right? Uh, learn to um, uh, to bend, as Tim Haig says. This bending, I'm sorry, this is not bending in issues of morality or ethics. Right? So, don't you know if someone says, you know, I think that it's okay to be uh, gay and to be a Christian. I think it's okay to to have multiple partners, even if you're married. I think it. You know, adultery is okay. I don't have a problem with it. You're not supposed to just bend and say, well, yeah, you know, maybe that's not so bad. You know, that's not the bending that Tim is talking about. So, um, in matters of uh, morality or ethics, right, uh, that's not the bending we should be doing. But what we should be practicing is bending in matters of personal choices. And in this case, conflicting halakha. So, we're talking about issues of food. Um, We're talking about issues that are not. Um, uh, going to make or break one's salvation, at least uh, at the surface level, right? We're talking about, um, you know, God's not going to save you if you keep kosher. He's not going to um, forbid you from entering heaven if you if you don't keep kosher. Those types of things. Tim concludes in this uh, section with: one may retain and enjoy one's freedom inwardly without having to express it to others. So be wise, um, listen to what other people have to say, kind of chew on the issue, and pray about whether or not you should openly disagree with people or openly challenge one another. Uh, those are some of the issues that Tim Haig is going to challenge us with. And I think at, um, at this juncture, I'll uh, call it uh, uh, quits for this section of our commentary. We'll push the rest of this to next week. Let me just scroll down through it real quick and see. Um, there isn't a lot yet in the uh, uh, commentary, um, but I do want to wait till next week so we can just look at all of Tim Higgs' comments in, in, in uh, total. And then I might next week also, after we finish this, um, pull some information from my commentary called What is Food as a closing uh, section to this. But um, that'll do it for Romans 14 Unplugged, Feast and Fast and Food. Oh my. These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week by myself, Ariel Ben Lyman Hana V. You can join us week after week, Saturday evenings from 5 p.m. to about 6 p.m. Um, Central Standard Time if you'd like to um, get involved in the live studies. If not, just know that the Harvest has their own live congregation. Let me see, I don't see anything in, in mentioning that um, they are in a uh, COVID lockdown at the moment. But um, if not, catch the sermons that we upload to our YouTube channel for Mark, Pastor Mark's um, material there uh, for. Uh, uh, my own home congregational resource at graftedin.com. We'd love to have you join us in person if you can, but if not, catch us live for the sermons there. These are the live internet studies that I bring to you um, week after week. You can go to my website at www.tetzetorah.com. That's T-E-T-Z-E-T-O-R-A-H.com for a variety of resources that you can see on my screen. I hope you can join me there in uh, studying the Torah uh, from uh, the notes that I supply. I also have a 
YouTube channel that you can uh, um, use for your own story study purposes or entertainment if, if you find my videos uh, entertaining. Find me on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Tetsu Torah Ministries. Once you hit my YouTube channel, make sure you do all the things that you see on my screen right now flashing on the screen. Uh, you know, subscribe, hit the thumbs up for videos that you like. Make sure you're leaving comments. Make sure you're... Um, uh, hitting the bell for notifications and make sure you're sharing the content with other people in your social media circles. Live internet studies is brought to you week after week, as I mentioned earlier, uh, each um, each Saturday afternoon. This is episode number 166 for January 15th, 2022. Central Standard Time is the time period 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, the live internet study, the hour-long study, is broken up into two 30-minute segments. Uh, Romans 14 Unplugged is the one we just went through, and now we're about to turn to segment two, where we explore the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. We're talking about who or what is the Holy Spirit. We're in part 98 in that section tonight. Um, and then if we have time, which I I think we do. We'll look at the video. Will there be animal sacrifices during the Millennial Kingdom? Another hot topic that often gets discussed in my uh, line of work. If you'd like to join us for the live studies, you need to get Skype somehow. Um, that is the platform that we use to um, uh, conduct the live internet studies week after week. And then if you are on my website at this particular um, section uh, at tatesaytor.com, take a moment and scroll to the very bottom to the black section where you see the footer, uh, the, um, uh, the Hebrew writing there, um, and consider uh, partnering with me in this endeavor to, to take uh, these Bible commentaries around the world like I'm doing via the internet. Um, I'm still in a difficult place in my life where I'm unemployed and I'm relying on the assistance from uh, friends and family members to help me get along, uh, to help me get along, to help me um, um, uh, uh, continue going. Um, and so uh, I'd appreciate it if you are uh, uh, so inclined. You can hit the little yellow donate button and uh, donate money security to my ministry. And uh, I'm, I'm certain to be blessed uh, with your generosity there. I know God is uh, using so many different ways to uh, bless me and to uh, keep me sustained during this difficult time, but your gifts and contributions are part of that. You're part of God's work and God's solution in that. I mean, it's just it's just exciting to see God working with uh, the gifts and the um, the contributions that are coming in. So continue to to pray for me, and as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. All right, let's turn to exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. Let's jump to the section that I need to be in. We're in exploring the Shema part three. Um, who or what spirit is indwelling believers? We took some time out um, to do a kind of a bit of an excursus on um, Romans chapter 8, where Paul talks about um, the spirit of God dwelling in you and the spirit which raised Yeshua from the dead. And we answered the question, who exactly raised Yeshua from the dead? If you look, look through the Bible uh, carefully, you'll find that the entire Trinity, and by the word Trinity I mean we have mentions of God raising Yeshua from the dead. We have verses that talk about God the Father specifically raising Yeshua from the dead. We also have, have verses where Yeshua emphatically said that he has the authority to lay down his life and to take it up again. So we could say that Yeshua raised himself from the dead. And then we have verses like this here in Romans where Paul's um, challenges with the idea that it's the Spirit. And we also have another passage in um, um, Peter where it talks about the Spirit uh, raised raise Yeshua from the dead. And we'll see that again here. Maybe, is it in this um, section? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But the point made in that excursus was that the Bible is quite nuanced in this uh, particular topic. But now we're, we're back to the regular study where we're asking this question, uh, what spirit is indwelling us? What spirit as believers is within us? And again, the, um, the kind of the generic garden variety overall uh, perspective that you should probably arrive at when you ask this question, what spirit is dwelling us? We should either say God's spirit, or we can just simply say the Holy Spirit. But don't be surprised if you have believers say, well, it's the spirit of Jesus living in me. It's the spirit of Yeshua. And it's because we have verses, we're going to just read through them, and then kind of comment on them, kind of uh, let the Bible speak for itself, where 
it's not as cut and dry to say that God's Spirit is dwelling within us. We have to let the Bible give us that kind of um, semi-equivocation or ambiguity where it's it's the Spirit in us, but it's who. Which person is named when we have the discussion of Spirit? Is it the Spirit of God? Is it the Spirit of Yeshua? Or is it the Holy Spirit himself. That's the discussion. So moving from Romans, kind of in chronological order of the, um, well, not chronological, but at least in the order that the Bible is laid out for us in our Bibles, right? That order, the book order. We next encounter 1 Corinthians 3.16. Most of these references are ESV that we're going to be studying, but um, some of them are not. Paul says in Corinthians, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So Right again, right away again, um, Paul is telling us without a question that God's Spirit dwells in us. Well, of course we know it's God's Spirit. I think Unitarians and Trinitarians would agree that it's God's Spirit that indwells us as believers. The challenge comes when Trinitarians go on to express um, that when they say God's Spirit, they mean the third person of the Trinity. Or some Trinitarians will say they mean the second person of the Trinity, meaning it's the spirit of Yeshua, the spirit of Messiah that dwells in us. That's where, of course, we have the difference of agreement between your Unitarian who say, no, God is not a tripart God. There's only one being known as God, and he only expresses himself in a unity, thus the name Unitarian, right? One God, one entity, one one person, if you want to borrow that word that Trinitarians use, but Trinitarians don't like the word person there. Um, so that's where we have some disagreement. Paul simply says God's spirit. So people who are Holy Spirit inclined read this verse and say, well, here you have it. It's the Holy Spirit. It says God's Spirit. What Spirit is God's Spirit? God's Spirit is the Holy Spirit. There you have it. Third person in Trinity. Why can't you read the passage? And yet many Unitarians will say, ah, ah, ah. It doesn't say Holy Spirit. It says God's Spirit. So we see there's some nuance to the text. And I think that that's what makes for uh, a very enriching Bible study is where we begin to admit that, wait a minute, it's not this this cut and dry argument that some people want to go to blows over. So just let the Bible speak for itself. If it tells you sometimes God's spirit, and then another passage, it says the spirit of the Father, or it even uses the word Holy Spirit, like we're going to read about in the very next uh, verse here, in the same book, same author, just different chapter, well then we have to let the Bible speak for itself. So let's look at these two passages, kind of compare them one against another. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says God's Spirit, but now in 1 Corinthians 6.19, same author, same book, Paul says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. So if I just look at these two passages next to one another, same author. It's almost like he's even repeating himself. Do you not know? Right? He says that in both verses. Do you not know? Do you not know? Your body is God's property. He even used the word temple in both passages. So what I think what's going on here is this is a great example where we have one passage that doesn't explicitly say Holy Spirit. It says God's Spirit. So for all you Unitarians out there who think that God's Spirit is only the Spirit of the being known as God, like as if I were to say, Ariel's Spirit was grieved, everyone listening to my voice would understand that that is a non-Trinitarian uh, statement, right? Because Ariel's not tripart in the same sense that God is tripart. I can't send my Spirit to do work for me the way we Trinitarians believe that God can send His Holy Spirit to do something for Him, and yet God Himself remains over in one location, if we can speak that way. First person versus third person, right? All those Unitarians out there who say that God's Spirit is not able to go from God, is not able to depart from God in, in a third-person fashion, are going to have to answer the question as to why Paul specifically then says the Holy Spirit in 619, when in 316 of Corinthians, he simply said God's Spirit. Now, I know, I, I, I've actually heard their arguments. I already know what they're going to say. But I'm simply reminding us, here's my exercise. The Bible doesn't always use this um, straight, clean-cut 
um, you know, um, no issue involved, no ambiguity, no uh, um, uh, 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 equivocation or anything like that. The Bible has a lot of nuanced, uh, that's my favorite word, right? You can tell, nuanced, has a lot of um, uh, places where we need to say, well, it could be Trinitarian. It could be Unitarian, but when we put it all together, when we look at the Bible as a unified whole, then I believe the best um, position to come to is the Trinitarian position. But I can understand that if we cherry pick, if we isolate verses from their context, I'm not saying all people do this, I'm not even accusing all Unitarians of doing this, but when we do do this, when we can find people who do do this, right, it does happen, when they cherry pick uh, and just isolate a verse, it's a passage, and don't let, allow, allow for more verses to bring, uh, to add to the discussion, then we can come to the polarized positions that we do where we say, well, I'm certain that the Bible only says this, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever our position is, and it's because we're not looking at the Bible as a whole. My exercise here as we're looking at all these passages is don't do that. That's a bad way to read your Bible and interpret it. All right, let's keep letting Paul talk. Again, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says a few chapters later, chapter 12, verse 4, Therefore, speaking to the same group of people, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. This is another triadic passage. What do I mean by the word triadic? T-R-I-A-D-I-C. Triadic. As opposed to trinity passage. Well, a Trinity passage might be a verse that someone says is um, definitely teaching that God is three parts. Do we have verses that actually say outright that God is made up of three parts? Um, maybe not Maybe not so black and white in that way, but we have plenty of verses that mention uh, the three persons of the Trinity in one verse. Of course, remember that the verse breakdowns are artificial. I don't think Paul actually sectioned his letter off into chapters and verses. Maybe he had paragraphs. I'm not quite certain. I know um, Biblical Greek well enough to say that there are definitely chapter breaks in the original manuscripts. Um, most of the original manuscripts that I've seen in Hebrew and in Greek uh, don't even contain chapter or sentence breaks. It's just like one, 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 one long running sentence that's that it appears to be in my eyes where there's no break between even you know there's there's no um there's no um punctuation where i can detect uh where one verse uh ends and where another picks up you just have to tell from uh you know you really have to be an expert to check to catch that so i'm really um thankful for the translators who break down uh the original manuscripts into chapters and verses but here we have an example where the translators broke this particular verse in such a way that Paul is mentioning God, the Father, right? Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. He mentions all three persons of the Trinity. So this doesn't mean it's a Trinity proof text. It just very means it means it's at least a, um, a triadic passage. But notice again, Paul doesn't say that it is the Holy Spirit that's in us until he gets to the very end of the verse. So I want to understand that no one's speaking in the Spirit of God. He says in the first part of the verse, and then at the end of the verse, he says the Holy Spirit, which if the Unitarian wants to argue that the Spirit of God is exclusively God's personal spirit, not a third person, then what the Unitarian is saying is that the Holy Spirit, used in the last part of the passage, must be another name for the first person of the Trinity. That's what must be going on if God isn't made up of three persons. Because Paul mentions Spirit of God in the first half of the verse, and in the last half he mentions Holy Spirit. And if your particular take on the Bible is that there are not three persons, well then I suppose you must come to the conclusion that Spirit of God is parallel to Holy Spirit. That's my take. However, again, I'm a Trinitarian, and I believe that Paul doesn't teach us that the Spirit of God, first person, is just another word for Holy Spirit in a third person, the third person in the, in the last half. I think Paul understands that God is complex, and that it is one God, 
there is one God, and yet God is complex, and that God being pure spirit also has a third person. He, Paul probably would not use the word person there. I don't think he does. I've never seen it. But um, nevertheless, Holy Spirit, there is a, uh, a third person of the Trinity. We've articulated that. I know people accuse Trinitarians of adding words that aren't in the Bible. Let's not go down that ridiculous um, argument path, because there are plenty of descriptions of God that aren't found in the Bible, yet we know them to be true true and accurate descriptions of God based on um, deductional reasoning. And so we supply modern descriptions uh, where the Bible is absent. Even the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but um, then again, neither is the word unity in the sense that the Unitarians are using it. So let's continue in this um, endeavor. Let's read a few more of these verses. Uh, Paul writing again to the same group of people, to the Corinthians. Uh, he says in this time, his second letter, 2 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23, he says uh, in verse 21, he says, and it is God... Uh, oops, I didn't mean to put the... I guess it's 21 and 22, not 23. Maybe I have a typo there. Um, either way, you've got two verses here. And it is... I'll have to go back and look at my commentary and see if it's supposed to be 22 and 23 or if it's 21 and 22. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, but Paul says, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So again... Um, this is a triadic passage. It mentions, from a Trinitarian perspective, it mentions God, who we equate as Father, first person. It mentions Christ, who we equate as second person. And it mentions Spirit, who who most Trinitarians equate, equate as third person, triadic. So God is the one who gives us his Spirit. Again, a Unitarian would read this passage and say, see, here we have it. It's God's Spirit, not the Holy Spirit, as if he's some third person separate from the Spirit of God himself. So I can understand how Trinitarians and Unitarians can have differences of opinion when they read these verses. Let's look at Corinthians again. We're going to spend a lot of time in Corinthians because um, Paul talks a lot about the Spirit in Corinthians, um, uh, and rightfully so. 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, And show you that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Again, um, a little bit of equivocation going on here. A Trinitarian can read this passage and can easily walk away with the idea that when Paul says the Spirit of living God, He's referring to the third person of the Trinity, known by Trinitarians as the Holy Spirit, but referred to by Paul as the Spirit of the living God. This is the way the Trinitarians interact with passages like this. However, I can also understand at least this is I, I can I don't I don't I'm not saying that you have to I'm not saying I even agree don't don't misunderstand when I say I can understand how Unitarians read the passage I'm not endorsing their perspective I actually disagree with their perspective that God is not tripart I think God is tripart but I my pers my my um, statement is meant to be understood that I can kind of understand where they are drawing their inference, where their interpretation is being used, because the Bible taken, if we just take passages and isolate them, then without surrounding context, we could be saying, well, it's going one way or the other. Context allows us to be more specific. Context allows us to, what we say, disambiguate, right? To be more specific and to remove the ambiguities. That's what disambiguate means, to remove the, um, um, the equivocations. And so, but, but, um, so the spirit of living God, is that God's spirit as in first person and no other persons? Or is that third person? Well, without context, we, we can't tell. That's the whole point. That's where I have to at least agree with, um, uh, Unitarians is that outside of context, verses can go either way. So we Trinitarians say, well, here's proof that it's Trinitarian. And the, the, the Unitarian can easily say, no, uh, 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 that's not proof that it's Trinitarian. Outside of context, could be Unitarian, could be Trinitarian. I have to agree there. That's my point. Let's keep going through uh, 2 Corinthians. Let's read maybe one more. Let's look at this longer uh, passage, and then we'll call it quits for this part of our study and, and move on to our liturgy and our video. In... Um, 
2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 18, Paul says, quote, But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil, speaking of unbelieving Jews, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. This is a great passage to study at length and mine it for its, its nuggets, particularly when Paul's challenging us with this idea of Old Covenant, New Covenant. In verse 15, of chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, um, Paul continues, Yes, to this day, is it chapter 3? Yeah. Um, Paul says, uh, Yes, to this day, speaking of the unbelieving Jews, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But, in verse 16, Paul says, When one turns to the Lord, ready for this? The veil is removed, and then he says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. Spirit. Now let me just stop. When one turns to the Lord, have you ever heard a Trinitarian call the Holy Spirit the Lord? Most Trinitarians don't use that lingo. We don't talk that way when we're talking about the Holy Spirit. But when, since we believe that God is a triune God, then it's not unusual or wouldn't be unnatural, I suppose, to refer to the Holy Spirit as Lord. But Paul here says, when one turns to the Lord, which most of us think and equate with turning to Yeshua. And indeed, that is, I believe, what Paul's trying to um, get at. Turning to the Lord means turning to Yeshua. Because Paul is going to state in other places, emphatically, that salvation is exclusive to turning to Yeshua. You cannot express genuine faith in God as your God minus Yeshua as Lord and be counted by Paul as a genuine believer. Understand what I'm saying there? Genuine Christianity or genuine um, believer status is afforded to those who turn to Yeshua as Lord. So it's really, really interesting that Paul says when one turns to the Lord, meaning Yeshua, the Lord is removed. And then if we remove that little verse number 17, just remember Paul didn't put the little number there. He says, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. I mean, wow, that verse makes your head spin. In verse 16, is he talking about Yeshua? The answer must be yes. In verse 17, when he says Lord there, in verse 17, when he says the Lord, if he's still talking about Yeshua, then why does he say that Yeshua is the Spirit, right? Is it the Spirit of Messiah? I guess so. And then he said, we're the Spirit of the Lord. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. If Unitarians want to claim right in the previous verse, the spirit of the living God or the spirit of the Lord, if the spirit of the Lord is God, well, then why is the spirit of the Lord being equated as Yeshua here, right? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. We know, and I'll close with this, we know as Christians that genuine freedom can only come about when one surrenders to Yeshua as Lord. Therefore, you know that these verses are speaking of our relationship with Yeshua and referring to him as Lord. But how is it that Paul can bring in this discussion that Jesus is that spirit? The Lord is the spirit? I thought Yeshua still had a physical body. How is it that he's the spirit? Okay, so we'll pick up that discussion next week. But that's the challenge that we're left with. Um, just be aware that when we're having discussions on the issues of Trinity, we've got to let the Bible speak for itself. If the Bible gives us challenging language to chew on, then let's just chew on it. We might not be able to fully understand it at the time, but we've got to admit that the Bible requires us to study it in its context, and it requires us to study it in its entirety. We cannot and must not take and isolate verses away from the context and form theology based on one single context or one single um, passage. And to that end, I think the Trinitarian model captures the best use or makes the best use of that particular um, advice of looking at the Bible in the, its broader context context. I think in my position, in my experience with working with Unitarians, there's more limiting of context when it comes to um, uh, citing passages for that particular position. But that'll do it for uh, exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity.
Let's turn to our liturgy, see if we can uh, knock this out. Let's maybe break this up into a few parts. Um, let me read through um, Jeremiah 31, 31 in the English and in the Hebrew, and we'll just start there tonight. Um, I'm not going to work through all of the other passages because this is going to be a long, kind of a longer, drawn-out um, particular section. The request that I receive from people who watch my YouTube videos and follow along with the um, liturgy part is that I read the Hebrew and make reference to this phrase, New Covenant, and start to talk about how that this shows up in the Greek Septuagint. It's utilized by the writer of the book of Hebrews in the Greek as well. Would I read this and comment on it? And so I, I said, yeah, let's do that. So we're, only, we're not going to get to all the Greek tonight. I think I'll just start with the Hebrew. Jeremiah 31, 31. As you can see on my screen, this is pulled from BibleHub.com's tool. And um, this is the true interlinear where we've got uh, Hebrew and then right underneath it we've got some English. And if we read the red part, the English, the wooden version, the kind of word for word, that's what I mean by wooden, we would read these words. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, with uh, and when I will make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah a covenant new. So some of the words aren't in the same order that we're used to seeing, but I left them in that order just because that's the order that they're showing up on the page right now. We can instantly see which Hebrew word corresponds with which English word. Let me read the Hebrew for you real quick, and then we'll just highlight some of the Hebrew for us. The Hebrew, reading from right to left, starting right there, the Hebrew says, Hine yamim ba'im Noum Adonai, Vaharati et Beit Yisrael, the et Beit Yehuda, Brit Chadasha. So the words that we want to highlight, let's just blow them up real quick for you. The words I want to highlight for you are these last two words on the screen New Covenant, or in the same order, it's Covenant New. So we have the word. Brit, right there, Strong's number 1285, is the word for covenant. And then the word Chadasha is Strong's number 2319, is the word new. And most of us are familiar with what a covenant is, but many of us aren't familiar with the nuance behind this Hebrew word new. So let's look at that real quick. Let's click on Strong's number 2319. If we click that, what we would end up with is this particular section. So if I uh, highlight that part right there, Strong concordance, Chadasha, is rooted in the word Chadash. The original root word, Chadash, is an adjective, and it's transliterated as Chadash. And the definition is simply new. But if we scroll down into the exhaustive concordance, we can see some more uh, details. It's from the word Chadash, uh, new. Um, which gets translated as new or new thing or new things or something new. But we can also see as we keep scrolling into the Brown Driver and Briggs uh, Gesenius lexicon, this information for us. This particular uh, adjective, just park it there. This particular adjective, new, um, or in the, the, uh, the it's feminine, the chadasha or something like that. Uh, we can see in definition A, uh, we can use this of new things like new king. Um, so in Deuteronomy, um, we have some references throughout the Tanakh, uh, that were, uh, through Old Testament, uh, the Torah proper song of praise in the book of Psalms, this shows up. We can compare some references in Isaiah and things like that. Um, Without getting too technical, because there's a lot of information there that probably not probably, probably going to go over most of our heads. The point that I really want to highlight is maybe in um, the B section of this um, lexicon. Very rarely predicate of um, you know uh, of of compassions of someone's compassions. They are new every morning of God's compassions. Uh, new every morning. New my glory shall be fresh with me. See, this is new. So we've got this adjective, chadash or chadasha, um, can be fresh or new or something like that. Notice it doesn't say anything here about renew per se. So you hear some people talk about how that this is a renewed thing, a new or renewed, new in quality versus new in quantity. Um, 
in this particular juncture, uh, it doesn't always talk about that. It doesn't give us that clean cut distinction between something that's brand new versus something that's simply been refurbished. However, the point I want to highlight, and then I'll close down this particular part of my um, liturgy just for now. This is just to kind of whet your appetite. We're not even going to look at the Greek tonight. That'll be next week. Is that when we talk about this root word, chadash, it's the same uh, origin word um, that gives rise to what we say new moon. If I'm correct, chodesh, as in rosh chodesh, head of the month, chodesh is rooted in the same word for chadash, the same root word that we're talking about right now, Strong's number 2319. I'll have to look it up to make sure. But if that's the case, when we're talking about new moon, it's not really a brand new moon that we see every month, is it? Is it? No, it's not. It's the same moon that we saw last month. It's simply new to us in its in its uh, cycle because it's it's come back around 30 days later to be a full moon or a new moon again. So when we say Rosh Chodesh as a new moon or new month is how we translate it basically, we're really talking about a brand new month, but we're talking about a recycled moon. So understand the kind of the overlap between and use of this word Chadash. Is it a new moon or is it really a renewed moon? You know what I'm saying? So we can say, is this a new covenant that God's making with Israel in Jeremiah 31, 31, or is it a renewal of an existing covenant just brought to a new perspective because of the Holy Spirit's presence. That's where we're going to talk about our discussion as we begin to draw this particular liturgy part out, but we won't do it this week. For now, let's turn to the um, video and watch the short little video on the um, animal sacrifices. And when we're done with the video, we'll simply dismiss in prayer. You ready? Here we go. Short questions, short answers by Tor Teacher Ariel and eBible. Copyright Tasty Tor Ministries. All right, here's my question Will there be animal sacrifices during the Millennial Kingdom? Let's find out. My little avatar says, yes, there will indeed be sacrifices in the millennium, and they will not merely be memorials, although they will likely include this memorial aspect. Essentially, they'll do the exact same thing they did thousands of years ago, which is provide a remedy to wash away ritual impurity from the sanctuary of the Lord and from the worshipers who approach him. We'll flesh this out later. And for those who have genuine faith in Messiah, besides providing purification of the flesh so that they can approach the sanctuary, the sacrifices will also assure them that Yeshua's death cleansed them for purity in both body and soul. So we must understand that atonement takes place on two levels. We have the earthly slash temporal and the heavenly slash eternal. And we talked about this in the last week's YouTube video. So go back and check that out if you're not quite sure what I mean by these two levels. The sacrificial system of old did not compete with Yeshua, Jesus. On the contrary, it complemented Yeshua's eternal sacrifice. The sacrifices did indeed purify the flesh, temporal, earthly level, and Yeshua's sacrifice did indeed purify our conscience from dead works and the heavenly slash eternal, the two levels working together. Hebrews 9, 13, and 14, which is going to actually complement the, the passage that we read in our liturgy, explicitly teaches this, right? Let's read this for a moment. This is, this is a great verse for us to understand the, the two levels of atonement that are taking place simultaneously during the time period of the Tanakh, to which we can then draw some inferences from when we begin to examine uh, sacrifices in the future. How will they function now that Jesus has come? Let's read this verse. Quote, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, right, notice that first part, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Also remember that Paul and those men under a vow in Acts 21, 23, and 26. Remember those guys? James tells Paul to go with the men into the temple to complete their vow and to purify himself along with them and to purify himself as well. So we ask this question, but if Paul is already ritually pure in Yeshua, why does he have to purify himself with these men? Right? Stop to think about that for a moment. This is after Yeshua had already come. Why is Paul even going through the steps? Well, 
Here's what the verse says. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourselves along with them. All right, that's what it says. The answer is obvious. James, like the writer to the book of Hebrews, like the writer of Leviticus, understood purification slash atonement on two complementary levels. Again, the two levels working together. James knew that he could tell Paul and these other four men, go ahead and go through the ritual, go through the motions, go through the observance that you're supposed to. Because we know as believers in Messiah that the sacrifices are not competing with what Messiah did. In fact, they complement him. The animal sacrifices conveyed both a temporal and an eternal aspect, eternal message to the participants. See how that works? They, they conveyed this, and it really depended on the heart of the individual, as I could kind of fill into my slide there. The older idea that, we, that we're very familiar with in um, Christian circles, that atonement was only a temporary fix for sins for those who lived in the time before the coming of Messiah must be abandoned. So the, the idea of atonement as portrayed in the scriptures actually encompasses both a temporal aspect as well as an eternal one. There are two levels that the sacrifices are talking about. So what's our conclusion for this particular week? Again, this is a very short presentation. The sacrifices performed with a genuine heart of repentance actually afforded real life forgiveness but only to the purification of the flesh and purification of the temple. So they had a designed role by God. They had a particular function that they were playing and God knew what that function was therefore they were working. And only the eternal blood of the perfect sacrifice to which the animals pointed could allow for purity in both body and soul. In other words as by faith we saw Yeshua, then we knew that we were actually receiving the full atonement. And this slide here should be very familiar. We got earthly sacrifices, we got heavenly sacrifices, and the two working together was the optimal view in God's perspective. Thus, someone like Paul could actually understand both of them working together uh, simultaneously uh, to accomplish God's purposes. Amen? Amen. Search for my iTunes podcast, search term Ariel Hanavi. Also, if you've got uh, YouTube, if you're um, uh, if you like to watch your theology, then subscribe to my YouTube channel. I upload content daily, almost daily, uh, particularly weekly for many of the series. So, if you like, follow along with me on YouTube. Also, be sure to hit the little notifications bell to make sure that you're receiving notifications for when I upload new YouTube videos. Okay. And that'll do it for the video for tonight. Let's dismiss in prayer. Abba, I bless your name, and I'm thankful to be uh, in, um, in a place where I can uh, connect with other people around the world and uh, so have a sharing of um, discussion on, on the words of God and praying with one another and just fellowshipping with one another via this particular medium of the internet um, because I'm in a place where I can't congregate with other people live so this is about the closest that I get so I'm extremely thankful that you have afforded this opportunity to me and that you're raising people up um, to also join with me in these live internet studies I pray that there'll be more people that join over time but um, for the small group that it is Lord I'm so blessed um, I'm overwhelmed with joy with with just the, the the presence of the people who are able to join me week after week bless them protect them strengthen them continue to raise them up where they're at you know our needs Lord before we even express them but draw us into prayer so that we can confess our um, needs to you so that you can demonstrate yourself to be a faithful God, a God who is able and willing to answer our prayer and in many cases always answers them uh, in the way that we pray them. Not always, Lord, but um, many times you do. So thank you, Lord, for um, uh, being in the type of God who hears us. You are a living God. You are a, a, a God who's trustable and reliable and therefore um, will serve you as our God. Thank you for these live studies. Continue to protect us and carry us along and give us a voice um, that we can speak so that we can share these truths with one another. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and glory of Shem Yeshua. Amen.